as a result of it, they drifted away from the Lord. You know, sometimes we've got to ex expect affliction from the Lord. Sometimes we've got to expect difficulties from Him. It's oftentimes during times of affliction, during times of hardship that we draw the nearest to God. Um, just to just kind of draw a parallel uh, between an old covenant people, Israel, who are out of plumb line, I would like to draw a parallel with a new covenant people, the Church of Laodicea. Mm -hmm. Now the Church of Laodicea was the seventh church in Revelation, and it's often compared with the church in this last dis dispensation, especially the church in the West. You know, the Laodiceans, um, they were rebuked by Jesus. And Jesus says to them, I know your works, that you need a halt or cold. I wish, but that you are lukewarm. And I'm ready to spew you out of my mouth. You know, Jesus is all right, but we are hot. That's where he wants us to be. That's where we all want us to be. All want to be. Or whether we are cold. Even when we are cold, at least we have made up our mind where we want to be. And if we cry out to the Lord, he's always willing to restore us back into that relationship with himself. Sometimes we grow cold because of circumstances, things that's happened in our lives. The Lord knows our hearts uh, inside out. But a lukewarm person is usually a person that's pretty much complacent. Mm. It's not really bothered either way or the other. They're quite smug. They're quite happy with their existence, uh, the way it is. And so what the um, Laodiceans did, they gloried in their world. Um, it says there, you know, Jesus says there about him, because thou sayest, I am rich and increased with goods. I have need of nothing. And you know, this is it. And then Jesus goes on to say, Jesus points out what they really have. It says, Thou knowest not that thou art wretched, you're miserable, you're poor, you're blind, and you're naked. And you know, can you imagine the irony in this, the paradox in this, where people actually thinking they're doing so well, and yet they're so far removed from being unlike with God. And Jesus says something really wonderful there. And he says, I counsel thee, buy of me gold tried in fire. You know, that's it, that's the key. You know, gold that's tried in fire has gone through something. You know, it's been going to hardship. It's gone to affliction. That's what our life is all about. When we sing that song sometimes here in this church, we find us fire. This is my heart's desire. That to be holy, set apart for you, my master, ready to do your will. You know, it's not about, in the Western world, it's often about what we possess. The material wealth we are looking at, um, how well we even do it in our education, um, in our job, our ambition. But really, what Jesus is looking at is where we are with Him and whether we are with Him uh, in the purposes that need to be fulfilled in those around us. I think the Western church people often say, well, you know, there's revivals going on in South America, in Africa, there's a big revival going on there. The Lord is really moving there. Why is the Lord not moving in England? And I think in England it's, it's, it's basically for that very reason. It's because people are not in mind with the Lord. Now Jesus goes on to say, And come and buy from me white raiment, that thou mayest be clothed, and the shame of thy nakedness does not appear. You know, sometimes <coughs> as we all walk closely to, to the Lord, uh, we just can't more or less veer away from that faith that is absolutely necessary uh, to stay in that place of purity and be clean before the Lord. And he calls them miserable, blind and naked. And then of course he calls upon them to buy the eyes of the eyes of. And of course the eyes solve uh, so that they might see. <coughs> you know what my experience has been? that sometimes we're looking in the wrong direction and think we're looking at things which are glittery and shiny but compared to the beauty of Jesus it just pales in comparison we sing that song sometimes uh, in, in, in the light of his beauty and his love the things of this earth become strangely dim now that's just the point I'm making before I'm actually going on to the next point 
And the next point is that even though the Church of Revelation was where they were, they were still in a better position than the children of Israel in the book of Amos. The reason why is that we as Christians we have been so privileged because our righteousness and our right standing before God doesn't really depend on us. How we walk with God, that's our responsibility. If we walk not the way the Lord wants us to walk, like the lay of the scenes, we're actually not walking in our true identity because we are the righteousness of Christ, um, of God in Christ Jesus. I just wanted to quickly go to a, um, um, a story about a man that we all know very well. He was born in the, in the early 16th century. His name is Martin Luther. Everybody knows Martin Luther. He was a great reformer in the 16th century. And uh, as Martin Luther was walking home one day, uh, a ball of lightning just struck right in front of him. He fell on the ground, shivering like a leaf. And he calls out to God. And he says, God, I'll, I will go into the monastery. I become a monk. Now, I know that wasn't a very good idea, but there was nothing else out there in those days. I mean, Catholicism was ruling the world at the time. But you know, Martin Luther's hard attitude was right. You know, he was fearing before the Lord, he was seeking. As he went into the monastery, he used to sometimes um, do penitence. He had an obsession with the rod of God. If you read in Romans chapter 1, it says that the rod of God is revealed against all ungodliness and all unrighteousness. Martin Luther took that very serious, and so should people be out there. You know, God is a holy God, he's a God of love, but he's also a God of rod. And aren't you thankful today that Jesus was willing to put that rod upon himself on our behalf? So Martin Luther was obsessed with the rod of God and he tried to attain the righteous standard that he thought he would have to live up to in order to be right with God. Um, he used to, what do you call it? Uh, flagellation. Flagellate himself. Flagellate himself like the Catholics used to, thinking that that might help. But according to Colossians chapter 2, willful humility and flatigation is never going to lead to freedom, it's going to lead to even more indulgence of the flesh, it's never going to set you free. So Martin Luther used to go with the brothers sometimes and they had times when they confessed their sins to one another and uh, to the great aggravation and agitation of his fellow brothers he kept going on and on and on <laughs> and on into the minute detail about his sin and the sinfulness before God. One day he was talking to an older brother um, and as the older brother looked at Martin Luther he saw the anguish on his face and um, I must have, he must have prayed underneath his breath as to well, how to help and how to ease Martin Luther's pain and he said Martin, brother Martin put your faith in the wounds of Christ and somehow that was the beginning of Martin's freedom. Soon after that he saw scripture uh, in Romans that we're all very familiar with which triggered the Reformation. And it's actually a scripture that's actually joined to that one scripture that he got so obsessed with. Um, it says, For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of hold the truth in unrighteousness but then the light fell on that scripture that precedes it where it says for therein is the righteousness of God revealed from faith to faith as it is written the just shall live by faith suddenly Martin Luther's heart was being set free and he saw that there was a righteousness available to them not the righteousness that almost made him insane and made him angry with God by the way as well but suddenly the Lord set him free and showed him that there was a righteousness obtainable or available to them, which was the righteousness by faith to what Christ has done upon the cross of Calvary. You know, in our day and age, uh, most of us are here. Uh, that's what gives us substance. You know, me as I stand here, uh, preaching God's or teaching God's word, I just feel unworthy. But I know that I have word because Christ has given his life for me. And when I go into eternity, and some of us might get there sooner than others, 
But when you get there, I know for a fact I'm not going empty handed because I have a lamb with me and it's Christ who was slain before the foundation of the world. Jesus said to his own disciples as they walked on his earth, uh, don't rejoice in that the demons are subject to you or that the sick are being healed, but you rejoice that your name is written in the Lamb's Book of Life. You know, we don't rejoice in what we do. That's our reasonable service. Rejoice in what Christ has done. And uh, Martin Luther found that glorious uh, uh, freedom when he read that scripture. You know, I just wanted to go on a little bit further with um, my observation about alignment. And there's a little toy that I wanted to put on the, um, on the screen. If you can do it, Tom. I know it looks a little bit of a ridiculous little <laughs> illustration for what I'm trying, the point I'm trying to make, but does anybody know what that's called, that toy? It's a toy that's been manufactured somewhere in the 80s. And uh, it's quite a revolutionary. Anybody knows? <laughs> it's called a wobble toy. And what's so peculiar about that toy is you can just smack it around, you can throw it back and forth, you can throw it to the outside of the room, and lo and behold, the toy always comes standing upwards. Now, if anybody has studied a bit of physics or has a bit of logical reasoning, it's obvious what they've done to the toy, but keep it simple. Stupid. <laughs> <laughs> if you look at that toy, the reason why that keeps standing up and doesn't fall over is because there's another law at work within that toy. According to physics, that toy would have fallen over time and time again, but there's another law at work in that toy. It's the law of gravity. Right at the bottom of that toy, there's a weight there. And whenever you throw that toy around, you slap it around, the hose comes popping up again. Does that remind you of somebody? Well, I'm perhaps the only one, but that is the Christian life. We have a righteousness available to us. When God puts his plumb line right next to it, it's always lined up. We might wobble the old times, but it always comes bubbling up. You know what Romans 8 says, um, verse 1? In Romans 8, verse 1 says that the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus has made us free from the law of sin. And you know, without that weight inside there, that toy would not be able to stand up. Without that law working in our lives, as a result of our crisis on upon the cross, we would never be able to stand up straight before God. But because of what Jesus has done, we can just stand boldly before Him and just come before Him in Jesus' name. You know, there's so much you can say about this little toy. For example, we can just put some script, scripture references to it. Greater is he that's in, in, in me than he that's in the world. You know, it's the Holy Spirit. Uh, somewhere in Romans it says the same Spirit that raised Christ from the dead will also quicken our mortal bodies. You know, uh, uh, another one would be um, and that, um, that we stand by faith. Because by faith we find ourselves have access to God's grace. That's in uh, Romans chapter 5. Now that we've been justified by faith, we have peace with God through Jesus Christ, by whom we also have access by faith into His grace where we stand. But you know, I would like to enlarge a little bit more about this wobbly toy that's gone off the screen, but I'm sure it's anchored in your memory. It's a little bit like us Christians. No matter how we flop back and forward, Jesus says, in this world you will have tribulation, but I have overcome the world. And no matter how we flop back and forward, we always come back up. Isn't that wonderful? Isn't that glorious? In Romans chapter 5, as we go to verse 2, it says that we not only glory in the fact that we've been justified and have peace with God, but we also glory in tribulation. You know, the wobbling back and forward in our Christian life has actually got purpose. Because purpose, the purpose is that tribulation work at patience. And patience work at character. And character hope. And then he goes on to say, and hope make it not ashamed. Because the love of God is being shed abroad.